watch Captain Kangaroo. I just had a random thought. Well, you know, um, obviously, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is kind of like a really prescient science fiction work. People like to refer to it a lot. You know, more than anything, 42. 42 just gets mentioned all the time. Everybody mentions it. And, like, some of the characters' names aren't really as referenced as, as let's say, other works, you know. But, like, there's a really badass chick in those books. And, like, her name is Trillian, and, like, no chick ever calls herself Trillian. I feel like that should get way more play. Because, like, there's, like, a lot of badass chicks in sci-fi, but, like, they're pretty much, like, that's one of the best. And, like, everyone's read it. I feel like if some chick rolled in to, like, a chat room with, like, a trillion handle, I'd be like, that chick's got it, man. She's awesome. I'm just surprised that that hasn't been out there. My name is Justin Robert Young. This is Jury Fry slash Saturday. Normally, we do this on Fridays, if you're just joining us for the first time. But we're doing it on Saturdays today, uh, or on a Saturday today, for a couple reasons. Number one, I went to go see Dark Knight Rises Thursday night, and also I had a game at, like, an afternoon go game Friday. So, to try and squish your Jury Friday in between waking up with enough time to be functional for the game... Uh, and, you know, preparing for the game, it was just not going to happen. And I was coming off three games in three days, so, yeah. Long story short, we're doing it today. And we're going to talk about everything that we were going to talk about on Friday. And, in fact, it's going to be a better show for this reason. Obviously, the big news is the, the shooting in Aurora, Colorado. And I'll get into that in a second, but I'm, I'm glad that I'm doing the show today... Or I am doing a show today as opposed to yesterday because I think that there's more, not more information about that story per se, but rather there's more of an idea of what the conversation is. And I don't really want to get into the political conversation about it. And that would be about gun control. People want to talk about gun control whenever there's a gun violence issue. And I don't really want to talk about that. What I do want to talk about is the idea of what our responsibility is when it comes to talking about this crime, and specifically the perpetrator of this crime, whatever his name is. I can't remember his name offhand. And that's something that I do want to talk about. There seems to be a sense that we should not be mentioning this guy's name. The reason why is that it would spur on copycats if damaged people saw the following equation play out in front of them. I crave attention. Somebody murdered people. Therefore, he got attention. So I want to murder people. If that is laid out in front of them, then they might execute on that course of action or be more likely to execute on that course of action. And there's not, you know, there, there's a fair amount of evidence. You know, I think Freakonomics talked about, you know, the copycat effect and people are more likely to do it if they're more likely to think that they can get attention. And there certainly is, you know, been uh, always been a lot of conversation about the celebritization of murderers. We're fascinated by murderers. We're fascinated. We're fascinated by murderers because they're flaws in humanity. You know, we don't know why they do it. It's incomprehensible to us, and so we look at them and, and wonder why. And we try to analyze their lives. And we look at what they took in, what they put out, who they interacted with, how what those people thought about it. And oftentimes we find out that they had no idea, which should stand to reason. Because obviously if somebody looked constantly on the precipice of murdering 14 people at a movie theater while Dark Knight Rises was about to play, then 
you know, we would do something. They would do something. It's not like we're all harboring murderers, you know, or anybody who lived next to this guy was harboring uh, a, a criminal. They didn't know. And it shouldn't be a surprise that they didn't know. But I guess here's my point. There's a lot of conversation about how much media we have. And I think it's a very, very, very good thing. In fact, I'm going to do a little test. For everybody who... For everybody who who says, and, and people are, are definitely going crazy in the chat room here, and I want that. Now, for everybody who says that the name recognition means something, do me a favor, and I'll, I'll give you guys a few seconds, but in the chat room, without looking it up, be fair, what was the name of the Virginia Tech killer? Went on to campus, Virginia Tech, murdered a bunch of people, he had written some shitty plays in his diary. Uh, we're getting in no idea. The Asian guy. No clue. Now, let me ask Steve McTiller Tudor. No, it was not Steve McTiller Tudor. He's a very peaceful man. Um, now, let me ask you this. Don't look it up. What was the name of the Columbine shooters? Probably the most famous school shooting in a 30-year history. Let's see. You remember? Okay. So call me DJM. He got it. And I... I, I, I think I could probably name it. I tried to name it yesterday when I, when I was thinking about this. It was, I think, Dylan Harris and Eric Klebold, I believe, were their names. I'm not looking it up. Uh, so I guess here's, here's my point. The more we obsess about everything, the more that we analyze everything, the more information that is out there, it is my belief, because we are functionally good people, Yes, Rabbit Badger, you're in the same chat as me. Because we are functionally good people, the things that are important will stick. And the things that are not important will not stick. And now that might not always be true. And there will always be blind spots. But I do believe, honestly, we are in a better position because there is more speech than less speech. And that's not always the case. I think it is, it is a great point of view. Because I was not <clears throat> all in on like the WikiLeaks thing. I don't think that everything should be thrown out there always. But in this particular situation, I do believe that the more we fascinate on this person and we talk about this person, number one, on a base level for humans, shows that we are a society that cares about our flaws. We're fascinated by our flaws because we want to correct them. This is a very loud, if statistically anomalous, flaw. We care about that. We want to know what that says about us. And I don't mind that. Guy Smiley says, more people die in traffic accidents every day, but nobody turns that into a media circle jerk. Well, I think that that's the difference between we figured that out, that we can drive in cars and we can get in accidents. We can die. We've thought about that since the advent of cars. The idea of somebody walking into a theater and murdering people, no matter by what implement, will always be fascinating to us. Murder, preplanned murder, will always be fascinating to us. Okay, so there's that. I do think that it's, it's, it's genuinely, it's better for us to talk more about it. It's better for us to obsess about it. And it's better for that guy's name to be out there. Because ultimately, we really want to hear his name now, and then we won't. No one will know his name. 
He'll be like the Virginia Tech guy. You know, he'll he'll be just in in the ether. You know, and and you know, we got fifty five people watching right now. And I asked the Columbine kids' names. One person knew it. You know, there's a large amount of people who don't remember the Columbine kids' names. And that thing was huge. It was massive. All right. Well, let's move on to more happy things. Let's talk about The Dark Knight Rises. I did see The Dark Knight Rises. It was on Thursday. And here are my thoughts. If you have not seen the movie, I will. this won't be a spoiler review. I'll try to do it without spoilers. And boy, there are, there are a bunch. And in fact, I will say this. I think this movie has fundamentally kind of changed my thoughts on spoilers. And specifically casting spoilers. Because there were a lot of things that happened in the movie that I already knew. And, and big turns, big twists that I knew because I just loved The Dark Knight so much and I loved Batman Begins so much that I read every single casting thing, every single on the set, guess who was shooting, rumor. Uh, and and it, it fundamentally kind of altered my experience with the film. If I hadn't read those, I think I would have enjoyed the film even more than I did and I sure did enjoy the film quite a bit. So, that being said, and it wasn't the trailers, it was more the casting things. And for anybody who's watch it, who's, who's, uh, who had watched the movie, um, you know, uh, you, you, you could know. I mean, you know, it, it's the big, the last, all the twists in the last 45 minutes I kind of knew because I knew that those persons were getting cast as those characters. Um, all right. Here is the difference between Dark Knight Rises and Batman Begins and The Dark Knight. Batman Begins, and I watched both of them uh, leading up to the movie. Batman Begins has just such a fundamentally different Batman. Christian Bale is magnetic as Bruce Wayne. He is just a different Bruce Wayne, a different superhero than we had really seen. He brought a kind of pathos and, and, and pathological nature to himself, to the idea of a billionaire who would go out and, and stop crime, that it was just fascinating. It was just amazing. It's hard to take your eyes off him. Similarly, in The Dark Knight, um, I mean... There's really not a whole lot of words to say about Heath Ledger's Joker. It's It almost overshadows the movie. You know, there are flaws in that movie. There's flaws in Batman Begins. There, there are. You know, and there are flaws in The Dark Knight Rises. But what, the dark, what Batman Begins and Dark Knight has is just supernova performances. You don't care about the flaws. You don't care about the plot holes. You don't care about the other characters that are like kind of meh. Um... You just love the fact that these things are happening, that these people exist, that they're talking, you know, uh, that, that every word that comes out of their mouths you're hanging on. And, and that's not quite the case. No character gets there in The Dark Knight Rises. Now, there are some very good performances. Anne Hathaway blew away my expectations. And, like, I like Anne Hathaway. I've enjoyed Anne Hathaway and things. I think she's a very, very good actress. I'm not the biggest Catwoman fan. Uh, but, so my expectations for her was, was not a lot. I kind of thought she'd be good. She'd be a good supporting player. Uh, she was great. She was really, really good. You know, it's hard to say I was disappointed by Tom Hardy's Bane because he did fantastic and I think the Bane character was very very good and there were great amazing moments but I know he has the capacity to be ledger good I know he has the capacity 
to completely own a movie. Because he's owned movies before. I mean, if you watch Bronson, yeah, that's not a good movie. But he's amazing. He is insane. He's great. He is a force of nature. And I kind of was hoping, I was very much hoping that Bane would be that. That, you know, that would be, it would be like Ledger's Joker where part of you was just like, I want to spend more time with Bane. And the difference is, in The Dark Knight, we get a, a lot of, not a lot, but we get two or three very, very key scenes. It's almost like its own story arc of the Joker interacting with the mob. It's his own little mini story that kind of goes alongside of whatever's happening with Batman. And in each of those, I mean, when you think about it, the most iconic Joker scenes in The Dark Knight are not scenes where he necessarily interacts with Batman. Now, the scene in the interrogation room, that's a Batman-Joker scene. But the scene in where he first meets the mob with the pencil, I want to see a magic trick, blah, that's him interacting with the mob. The scene where he uh, goes to the guy who offered the bounty on his head and murders him, that's a scene with just him and the mob. And then him lighting all the money on fire. Right? Spoiler alerts for the fucking Dark Knight, by the way. Where he lights all their money on fire. That's just him and the mob. And those are three of the most memorable scenes. Remember, the scene where he first talks to the gangster is the first time we get the, you want to know how I got these scars? That's the first scars monologue comes there. We didn't quite get that with Bane. And I really wanted it. I really, 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 really wanted either him interacting with his people. Uh, we get the beginning, the opening scene, which was the one that was in the IMAX thing, so a lot of people know about it, but it's the scene with the plane. Uh, you know, we, we got him on his own sort of journey. And we get moments of that. There's one scene in particular that's fantastic. Uh, but I just wanted more. I wanted more Bane. Now, about the voice. It is an extraordinarily... And I like the voice. I liked it a lot. I thought it was distinctive. I thought it was good. But it's an extraordinarily <laughs> ballsy choice to have a voice that's already going to be modulated because it's behind a mask to also have a very weird accent and a kind of, like, theater professor enunciation. <laughs> Like, he has these, like, <laughs> My name is Bane, everybody. Come talk to me. It's Bane. Uh, it's pretty ballsy. I can't imagine, like, where they decided to say, like, just have all those things. Number one, it's going to be, Definitely like through a mask and it's going to feel, it's going to sound through a mask, not just like kind of muffled, like I'm just talking with my hand over my, my mouth. You know, it's not just going to be that. It's going to be something very, 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 uh, you know, Darth Vader-y almost. And I do think that that's, that's uh, <laughs> Black Panda. Office hours are one, two, three. Your punishment must be more severe for turning in your paper late, Mr. Thompson. <laughs> Pain PhD. <laughs> um, so, it's, it's, very, it's very interesting. Ryan Aquit, it, it, it sounded Sean Connery. It sounded fairly Sean Connery-esque. It was very, it was very, very interesting. So, you know, what can I say beyond, uh, you know, without getting into spoilers? It, it, it is lacking that one big character. Um, but, you know, it's great. It's a fantastic end. And, and really, when you, when you look at these three films, when you look at the trilogy that was put together from that, I mean, it's fantastic. It's a it's a great three set set you know it's a 
you know, I guess, you know, I don't know what, it's kind of, if, if I'm going to look at how I rank it, it's kind of similar to uh, Back to the Future. Like, love Back to the Future. Back to the Future 2 is my favorite. And Back to the Future 3, I really, really like, but I totally understand why other people aren't crazy about it. But I really, really enjoy it. That's kind of where... Where, where I'm at on it. Now, the Batman trilogy, trilogy versus the Lord of the Rings trilogy. That's a very, very interesting question, Rabbit Badger, because Christopher Nolan came out and said in the Entertainment Weekly uh, article about The Dark Knight Rises that the Lord of the Rings trilogy was what he kept looking to to emulate, okay, if I'm going to do a big epic three-movie thing, this is one that was done extraordinarily well. And I do agree that there... Dark Knight Rises shares a lot with Return of the King, specifically in there are moments where it kind of feels like we have end fatigue. Obviously, you know, and this spoiler alert for Return of the King, you know, there's a 45-minute end sequence for Return of the King where you keep thinking the movie's fucking over and it just doesn't. Um, now, I think it was good. I think it was very, 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 very good. You know, I enjoy all three of those movies, but there's a moment where, you know, we're just kind of like, okay, no, I get it. I get it. Yes, we have to wrap that up. Yes, we have to wrap that up. Yes, we need to make sure that these characters end in these certain positions. Um, I'll say this, and I'll just, this is the only thing I will end spoiler-wise. Um... You know, it isn't even a spoiler. I'll just say this. For when you watch the movie, for when you watch the film, if they, if Nolan made another movie with starting the story from where he ends The Dark Knight Rises, I think I would be in 150%. I couldn't imagine not being so into this it would be the biggest movie ever i would love it i i you know i know he doesn't want to do it he's not going to do it wouldn't be prudent but man man if he did man if he did it would be awesome i would really 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 be excited for that all right well I'm going to play a music song, and then we're going to come back. We're going to talk about the movie draft. We're going to talk about politics. So this is Jury Saturday. I'll be right back. That's a Spinto band. I'm wearing this shirt. This is Jury Saturday. I want to talk about the Man of Steel trailer. Uh, okay, so that played uh, ahead of Dark Knight Rises. And I didn't like it. <laughs> I thought it was boring. I thought it, we've kind of been there before. I wanted some... I, I wanted... I think for a, a, a... The best teaser trailer that I've ever seen for a movie. Now, granted, it's kind of hard because you had already had Batman Begins, but the teaser they played at Comic-Con for Dark Knight was amazing was great if you remember it was just just there was no footage just audio of the batman logo kind of coming together and it was michael kane as alfred doing the in their weakness they turned to a man they couldn't trust that kind of sounded like morgan freeman uh they turned to a man they couldn't trust some men mr wayne just want to watch the world burn. Uh, and then you heard the Joker cackling. <laughs> right, okay. So, <sighs> Man of Steel trailer, brooding shots, kid running around with the cape, and then the only action shot we get is Superman shooting off into the atmosphere uh, after he kind of broods around a little bit. <sighs> I don't know. I'm not saying the movie's gonna be bad. I I think I saw I like Snyder. I really do. But 
was not in love with that sh teaser. Was not in love with it. Not by a long shot. So we'll see as that goes forward. I think he's an extraordinarily competent action director. I think the thing that I've been most encouraged by this movie is that they want to do a more physical Superman. I think having Lex Luthor as a opening villain in a Superman movie is kind of problematic because he can just punch Lex Luthor right in his dumb face and break him. You know, to have Zod be your villain, I think is very, very good because it gets Superman in a position where he has to test his powers and where he is put to the test by somebody else who has the same kind of infinite prowess. So we will see. We will see. Uh, Snowshoe says, I hope it doesn't end up like Sucker Punch. Yes, I agree. Well, while we're on the, poly or on the uh, topic of movies, let's take a look at the summer movie draft. Now, it'll be very interesting if we do more of these on Saturdays because we will be able to see at least the Friday returns. Um, right now, we only have the Thursday returns. It was a huge opening day for Sarah Lane. Oh, it's a spider! $30 million on Thursday. Wow. Obviously, the shooting is going to be something that factors into it. I don't know if anybody really knows how much. Um... I was talking to Andrew. Andrew kind of uh, said that if he believed that if, you know, there was a dip, if, if today, if this weekend was lower than what people were expecting or there was a sense that people should not go to the movies because they feel unsafe, that the second week would be even bigger because you would start to see a backlash. Like, let's all go see the movie Midnight on Friday uh, to stand in solidarity with, you know, the moving going public and, and return a sense of safety and normalcy to going to see a midnight movie. Because, boy, do I love it. You know, I would be really, you know, and, and you know, I said this on, on Twitter. There's, there's a few things I love more, man, than just like that midnight movie buzz. It's just so awesome. It's just like a mini, it's like a mini con, you know? It's like a mini con all based on one movie. It's just so fun. I love the lines. I love the costumes. You know, there was these uh, the Joker and a Batman that were, like, doing these, like, really comical. They had, like, a whole rehearsed choreography. Um, it was just great. It was amazing. I, I, I love it. I would, I would really, really, really be upset if that culture was in any way damaged by what that fuckhole did. Um, you know... <sighs> Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to say. I mean, it's just such a sad, sad story. But uh, I, I really hope people go see this movie. You know, no matter what the, you know, obviously, fucking whatever the draft is. Uh, but everybody deserves to go see the flick. Okay, as it stands right now, I am in the lead with seven hundred and forty-two million dollars. Scott is in second place with six hundred and thirty-eight million dollars. Tom has six hundred and thirty million. Brian is out of it at six oh four. Uh, Veronica, unless the Bourne legacy becomes, you know, fucking the Avengers, then she's out of it. And there sits Sarah with her venom huffing mask on. When the movie draft is in ashes, you have my permission to die. She's saying to me. That's what she's saying. Um... Yeah, so we'll see. I mean, I guess it's really hard to even talk about this because of the shooting, you know. Uh, it, it's hard to to look at it and say, you know, what's going to happen? I don't know. You know, uh, I think everybody should go out and see this movie. I really do. I really think that now it is it is more of a thing. Now it is something there that we need to protect our movie-going experience. We need to show, for people who love this, who love movies, you know, I think we do, I think we do need to go out. We need to go out in force and we need to go ahead and show that we, we still feel safe. And if we still feel safe, then other people should feel safe. Just because one fucking asshole, you know, doesn't mean that we got to ruin, we got to change the way that we live our lives. Fuck him. Fuck him right in his stupid fucking asshole. Um, Snowshoe says, why aren't we feeling safe? Well, I mean, people might not feel safe because of the shooting thing, you know. They're going to walk into, I mean, some people are claustrophobic. Some people, you know, panic about things like that. To be in a closed room when, when this happened, you know, there's a reason why this, uh, 
you know, there's a reason why it was a terrifying claustrophobic scene in Inglorious Bastards. Spoiler alert, uh, when, you know, everything happens in that movie theater, and that's where the good guys are doing it, you know. Um, it's, it's, it's brutal, and it's, it's something where, you know, people might be weirded out about it, and I don't think they should. I think they should be, they should be having fun at the movies, a ah, big fat nerd time, just rubbing their nerd against each other, causing nerd friction. Ooh, nerd sparks. Nerd sparks. Mm. We don't know how this will affect the 2012 uh, election. I, I suspect it probably won't all, all that much. I think people are going to talk about gun control. If one of the campaigns wants to make gun control a thing, it would probably be the Obama administration because uh, I think that they would have more of a sympathetic bounce to it because they would say we need to solve this problem with laws. Um, you know, and then, then Romney would have to uh, react to it, but I, I guess that would really depend on, you know, like right now, let, let's take a look at the the electoral map. Our, our big swing states are Florida, North Carolina, Virginia, and Ohio. Those are states that are within you know, they're toss-up, considered toss-up within statistical margins of error in current polling. Um, you know, those are, are fairly high contingents of pro-gun people. So if, if Obama came out super hard, uh, you know, you know, for or super hard for greater gun regulation, I think it would be a very tricky proposition. He would be hoping that there would be more, you know, people that would turn out in those states that would help him win um, than people that would be upset by that and would and would want to come out and uh, and vote against him. Now, hey, I'll tell you what. I mean, it's not, not not a ton of electoral votes, but Colorado is a toss-up state. And by the way, man, Colorado just been getting the shit kicked out of him lately. I feel bad, man. Everybody in Colorado, they had the fires, they had this. Tebow left. <laughs> You know, there's just not a whole lot good happening in Colorado. Holy smokes. All right, well, let's take a look at uh, politics right now. Of course, the big news is Romney kind of waiting to announce his vice president, his vice presidential pick. And I know that, you know, throughout the times that people have uh, read, or sorry, not read, but watched here, I have been very, very critical of the Obama campaign because I haven't liked the way it's run, and I've been fairly positive about the Romney campaign. So I'm going to read something from somebody about the Romney campaign that I totally agree with. So here we go. Uh, talking about uh, Obama's Bain attacks, uh, Bain capital attacks, not <laughs> Obama's uh, Bain... <laughs> Your business record leaves something to be desired, Mr. Romney. This is my Bane attack. Okay, still they've had an effect. The Romney campaign's response, which included whiny demands that the president, that the president apologize for his attacks, has unsettled GOP activists, causing them to wonder how prepared Mr. Romney and his team are for the mud fest they've entered. The attacks have drawn attention to the Obama campaign's demand that Mr. Romney release more years of tax returns, and they've allowed Mr. Obama to avoid talking about the continually bad economic news, lousy June job numbers, and last Friday's drop in consumer confidence, Tuesday's drop in retail sales, and more. The danger for Mr. Romney is that if these charges go unrefuted, they could discourage swing voters from going to him this fall when they decide whom to support. Now, that is a fairly critical... Fairly, fairly critical statement about the Romney campaign that I totally, totally agree with. I think that the Bain Capital stuff, I think that the tax return stuff is more of an issue when you are not putting the other candidate on the defensive. And I think Romney has done a terrible job 
post-Supreme Court health care ruling of shaping this the way that it should be shaped for him. If he would like a greater chance at winning the election, I think he's done a bad job. Now, I still don't think Obama's done a good job. I think that the Bain attacks are way putting his, his eggs in, in, in the wrong basket. I think him going hard after the SEC filing is is just, you know, it's cheap heat. You know, it's a thing for 24 hours. But, you know, to me, it just it feels like, like you know, where's the birth certificate? It, it, it very much feels kind of just empty to me. Like it really doesn't say a lot unless you have an absolute smoking gun. And you can just spin your wheels and, you know, get cheers from people who are already going to vote for you. Or you can really make hay about what this person's going to do for the average voter in Virginia, North Carolina, Florida, Ohio, if they get in. And I don't think that he's done a great job of doing this, but I think Romney has done a, a stellar job of not doing shit. He hasn't put forth, you know, he hasn't gotten out on the attack. Now, who wrote that? Rabid Badger writes in the chat room, is it Drudge? Is it Rush? Obviously, it was somebody, you know, I think it's somebody who is sympathetic to Romney getting elected. That is very, um, you know, it is, uh, it is, it, it means more when people on your side are, are criticizing it. The National Review, Cow Eat You, writes, um, no, it is, Somebody who I believe probably knows more than anybody else on the planet uh, about electing Republican presidents, Karl Rove. Karl Rove, this was part of his column in the uh, Wall Street Journal from July 19th. Uh, he knows a little something about getting, uh, you know, even fairly unpopular Republicans into the White House. He's a dude who does not ignore... Uh, reality, you know, you don't ignore reality if you get people elected regularly. It just doesn't happen. And this is a guy who also has his own kind of skin in the game because his PAC has raised a hundred million dollars. They, they will spend a hundred million dollars to either to elect Republicans in Congress and get Romney into office. That's something that is going to happen and it is happening right now. So, uh, you know, it says something when he's critical and I do agree with him. I think that there's plenty of reason to be critical about the Romney campaign. Now, I said, I said last week that I think if, if Condoleezza Rice is, is the VP, that uh, they're that much closer to winning the White House. It looked less likely in the middle of this week like that was going to happen. It seemed like Tim Pawlenty, who sounds like a kind of bread, Pawlenty bread, you know, like I walk into Trader Joe's, I would see white wheat, whole grain, polenti, uh, old teapaw, like he was going to be the veep. I think there's probably very good reason to believe that there's a lot of internal debate that no matter who is picked for vice president, that there will people be people inside of the campaign that will not be uh, particularly happy about either pick. But I think, uh, you know, I think Condoleezza Rice kind of changes the game. You changed things. Uh, so, <laughs> select Joe Biden, Cowie 2. It throws a little chaos into the system. That would be awesome. I, I think Joe Biden, <laughs> Joe Biden's ridiculous. He's a ridiculous human being. Uh, so, there we go. Uh, Rabbi Badger says it won't be Connie because she's not a politician. Well, I mean, she hasn't wanted to run. That's been absolutely true. Uh, the question is, you know, will, I mean, you don't have to be a politician. You know, you might not want to be, but she is an administrator. She is somebody that knows how the White House works. Uh, Condi's record is a problem. Oh, yeah, but everybody's record's a problem. I mean, there was a fairly good, to go back to Karl Rove, there was a fairly good Karl Rove column about selecting a vice president. And apparently, um, when Bush was set to select Dick Cheney in 2000, there was a meeting with Karl Rove, Dick Cheney, and George Bush. And 
George Bush said, uh, why don't you want Dick Cheney to be vice president? Because Karl Rove was not in favor of it. He didn't like Dick Cheney as vice president. And he, ex he had to explain to Dick Cheney's face the reasons why he thought he would be a bad vice president. A lot of it was political. He didn't think that it played in the areas they wanted to play in. He didn't think that he got, gained them things that other possible candidates could gain them. And ultimately, according to Karl Rove, George Bush said to him, it's your job to fix those. It's my job to pick who I want. And so he picked Dick Cheney. So I would say it's the same thing. Is Condi's record a problem? Yeah, sure. But everybody's, everybody's got weaknesses. It's the campaign's job to minimize those and maximize the positives. And that's where I think the difference lies is that there's a lot of positives to Condoleezza Rice, specifically because you can do something that is fundamental to swing voters. You can, uh, you can fundamentally paint Barack Obama as somebody who is in over his head and inexperienced. With the Condoleezza Rice Romney ticket, you can look at both of them, and when they say, we can bring a steady hand to the till, it makes that much more sense because she's been in office and people have liked her term in office. They, by and large, had a very, very good feeling about her, and she comes across as somebody that will be able to say, if she does run, if she does run, uh, she will be able to say that I didn't want to run. But this is something I felt the call to run. And that's why, uh, that's why she ran. Now, um, now and Ravi Badger says Cheney picked himself. That's absolutely true. He certainly did. He was put in charge of the Vice Presidential Selection Committee. And he said, Mer. And for some reason, Cheney, I want to use the Bade voice for Cheney. <laughs> I've reviewed all of the candidates. And I found that I'm the best one. Mr. Bush, why don't I become your vice president? Um, so, uh, Sardi Man, who is a uh, drunkard, who is drunk, I guess. Uh, am I pro-Obama or pro-Romney? Saucy Duck, he says, I seem libertarian Republican. I don't think I've been, you know... Uh, I've kind of minced words. I, I, I lean more toward libertarian causes. Uh, I am certainly not a fan of uh, the libertarian party in terms of some, you know, the people that they that they put out there. But I mean, in generally, I'm just kind of for things that work. I like things that work. I don't like things that don't work. I guess that's where I'm at. Uh, I, I don't. I don't. I, I like. I like fixing problems, and I don't like doing damage in terms of government i don't like doing damage to things that already work and i like them fixing problems in smart ways so there we go all right well you don't want to know anything that wraps up this edition of jury saturday i very 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 much uh enjoyed this this was good i like you guys i would consider myself a problem solver a problem solved all right. Well, um, okay, real quick. Let me do some plugs. Number one, I had a great interview with uh, two of the guys who were on America's Got Talent on iTrix. Go ahead over there to the Magic Week and Review. Jarrett and Raja, if you like America's Got Talent, uh, then go ahead and check that out. Number two, uh, fantastic episode of Weird Things this week. Great. The introduction of the character, Mouse Elvis, who will surely come back because I love doing mouse elvis we can go on together thank you very much we're suspicious minds mouse elvis has left the building everybody who's got some burger sets um third i thought it was a great uh an absolutely fantastic episode of nsfw sarah lane came back we did some old school problem solvers i thought it was super fun and big news folks this tuesday man i'll tell you what it is the one year anniversary of the twit brick house and uh, we're going to tear that motherfucker down brick by brick with rock music. Get Set Go plays live 
right there on NSFW. We'll have the final countdown to the Diamond Club book. Um, allegedly, there's going to be a slumber party. Uh, it's going to be absolutely fantastic. I don't even know whether we're going to have a guest. I mean, I guess Gets at Go is definitely going to be the guest. Uh, Dick DiBartolo might be around, I've heard rumors. He's definitely going to be in Petaluma that night. Uh, we might be able to figure that out. Uh, there might be, maybe we'll have Lex Luthor steal 50 cakes. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen, but it will be amazing. So go ahead and check us out live this Tuesday. I think we're going to be a little late. It might be around like 8 o'clock uh, Pacific time, like 11 o'clock East Coast time. We will figure that out. Um, how's Mike TV doing? He disappeared from the net. Well, you're going to find out, you know, this Tuesday. They're They're driving up. Live. They're going to rock the brick house. It's going to be hilarious. And um, I'm going to be in Seattle tomorrow. Tomorrow and Monday for a Go Game Monday. I'm going to be in the Pike Place area. So if you are at or near Seattle, holler at a player when you see him in the streets. Um, it'll, be, uh, it'll be a fun time. All right. Well, that about wraps it up for this edition of Jury Friday. Uh, I want to remind everybody, Justin R. Young is where you can find me on Twitter. Until next week, please don't die. Don't murder people. It's a bone. Oh, also, uh, FSL Tonight, it's amazing. Go get it. New episode. Amazing.